right. Hopefully, uh, I'll be only five or ten minutes. I know I'm the last speaker and everyone's probably tired, but I wanted to give you a more personal view of what this research means and how exciting it, it really is. Um, is this, yeah. I think my microphone's on. I don't know if you can hear me okay. Um, but I'm going to give you a personal viewpoint. Uh, I have an IDH1 tumor. It was removed in August surgically, and I'm a PhD student here. Um, and it's, it's kind of funny. Usually when I give talks, I'm talking about my research. I'm talking about the data. And I work on large-scale printing and electrocentering to make capillary networks, and even 3D printing synthetically designed organisms. So stuff that's very not relevant to IDH tumors. Um, so this is a personal story, and I've never given a personal story before. And this is the first time that I've talked about this publicly. Um, but I really respect uh, Professor Van der Heiden's work. I talked to him before my surgery. And the best place to get cancer is at MIT, because you have these resources. <laughs> so uh, this is the reason why I am here tonight. Um, I truly do think MIT saved my life, and I'll tell you why. Uh, this is what my brain looked like in late July. And uh, it's a pretty large tumor. And it all relates back to curiosity. Um, I think that's what connects us all here. That's why we're here doing research. And ironically, that's how I found my tumor. Um, so I was curious about seeing my brain. And I bet you guys all in the audience are now, too. Um, <laughs> so in 2007, I wanted to see my brain. And so I did a research study, an fMRI, where I looked at spiders. And they looked at my brain. And I asked for the raw data back because I wanted to see my brain. And they said, OK, just so you know, you have an abnormality here. It looks like it's near your smell center. But don't worry, lots of people have abnormalities. So I said, OK, that's a little scary. Um, what should I do? And they said, get it rescanned in a few years, see if it changes. So this is actually what the scan looked like in 2007. And I got it rescanned in 2010. And it hadn't changed. So they told me, you know what? A lot of people have brain abnormalities. Don't worry. This is probably, it hasn't changed in the last three years. Don't worry. So I went about my business. And then in July, I started smelling a weird vinegar smell for about 30 seconds every day. The very, very light smell. I could be talking to you, having one of these episodes, which they now call seizures. And you wouldn't know it. And I would barely know it. Um, but because I knew I had a brain abnormality, I went to MIT Medical for the first time in four years. And I said, I need to get an MRI scan. And this is what they found. So it had grown um, to one of the largest sizes that the neurosurgery team has seen believe it or not. And somehow, I'm at MIT using my brain for all that I can. Um, crazy. So I work in digital fabrication, so we have some really nice resources. So I love data and collected it all. And actually, I printed out a couple copies of my tumor. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass these around. And you can see how big that is. And that's what they took out of my head in, uh, in August. So this is some interesting statistics. Um, and I just heard this from Ed Boyden today, who is a brain scientist on campus. There's about 100,000 neurons per cubic millimeter of your brain. My tumor was around 120,000 cubic millimeters, meaning they took out 12 billion neurons or 12 trillion synapses. Now, as a notion to that, that is way more than any computer supercomputer uh, that currently exists. So our brains are pretty powerful. And somehow, I'm still talking to you here without that. So it's a very, it's a very crazy thing to me. Um, so I, I still feel great. Um, and the best place really is to fight it at MIT and Harvard. And I wanted to thank and tell the story of um, how it happened. So of course, family, girlfriend, and friends are extremely important. The community I got to talk to. The top professors in biology, I got to talk to uh, Matt. I got to talk to Ron Weiss, Ed Boyd, and George Church even, and say, what would you do if you're in this situation? Um, and Neri Oxman, uh, who's one of my advisors with David Wallace, um, and Yoel Fink, I want to specially point out, because they stepped up to the plate, sent out my MRI data around the US, and said, who's the best neurosurgeon for this operation? And they got me a meeting with him the next day, and I ended up having surgery with that doctor, Dr. Kioka from Brigham. And it was amazing because of that connection, I had uh, new options. I got the surgery videotaped. 
I had my genome sequenced. I have mouse models made. I'm doing my minor in synthetic biology for the last three years. So I actually was able to play with that data. Um, and the actual surgery was done uh, in the Agios, or sorry, the Amigo suite, which is the top robotic suite for surgery at the Brigham. Um, and it's a fascinating place. This is actually, I'm not going to show you anything gory, so do not worry. <laughs> this is video from my surgery. This is the surgery room and they're waiting for me. I have the whole surgery videotaped. If anyone wants to see highlights from it, come find me later because it's fascinating. I'm not going to show you because it is graphic, but I have the scar. You can still see it here. They opened my head up and literally with pliers and a scalpel extracted it while I was awake. So it was an awake brain surgery. And the reason they do this is because they had to cut through healthy brain tissue and they wanted to make sure they're not cutting my language center. So on the video, and I'll be happy to show it to anyone that wants to see it. I'm going to make a YouTube video out of it. Um, <laughs> I'm, talking, I'm talking about my research, about my girlfriend, random topics while they're cutting out my brain. And uh, it was incredible because they were probing certain regions while I was talking and all of a sudden my voice would garble or my words would go flat. And in my brain I remember about 20 minutes of that operation and I can distinctly remember losing the ability to find words and I was thinking in colors and it's the weirdest drug experience you could ever have. <laughs> so this was me after surgery. Um, if any of you are worried about the surgery, it's actually not painful. The brain doesn't really have pain receptors inside, physical pain receptors. Um, and I actually quite enjoyed it, which is a weird thing to say. <laughs> but in two days after I was out of the hospital and within a week I was back on MIT campus. Um, so pretty crazy. This was what the brain looked like before. This is what it now looks like after. And the weird thing is the brain doesn't really regrow. So that's going to be a hole basically for the rest of my life. It's very interesting. Um, the benefits of being at MIT is you have access to these resources. Actually, the exact same type of spectroscopy done, was done on me that was highlighted in the previous presentation to look for that 2-HG uh, chemical. And so I've actually been working with that same colleague and I'm getting my next scan on Halloween, and that's going to determine what the next steps are. So I'm in line for proton therapy and or x-ray therapy, it's still not determined, and chemotherapy likely starting in the next month. But the importance of Matt's research and Agios is trying to know if they can detect whether the tumor's there, because the MRI can really only see basically the regions, and they don't know if it's scar tissue or edema or, or tumor, but if you can see the 2-HG, then you know the tumor's still there. Now the problem is the resolution's still not where it needs to be and all that stuff, but this is the importance of, of the research. It's, it's absolutely critical. Um, but doing the MIT way of fighting science, I got to get my own tumor back and look at the, the slides. So this is actually what my brain looks like. And the ones that are kind of faded are the ones actually dividing the glial cells um, that are actually cancerous. Um, so what changed in me? What does it feel like to wake up losing a big chunk of your brain? Um, not that much. Um, there were a few key changes. I can only sleep for about three hours now, and I wake up basically like an alarm clock after three hours with more thoughts than I know what to do with, and it's a very weird feeling. Um, new connections must be forming, and I wake up with literally too many thoughts to go back to sleep, um, but it's starting to get better. Um, other couple weird things, my hearing improved, at least my perception of it, so I think the tumor was somehow reducing my perception of the hearing because I used to listen to my iPod at 100% and now I can only take it up to about 50 or 60. So very odd. Um, and my hands and my feet get colder faster. So very odd things, but I'm very lucky. There are way worse things that could have happened uh, in that surgery room. So, but what did I learn? Um, got all kinds of data, video, genome sequencing. We're here at, at MIT, mouse models, microscopy, analysis, and I'm now interested in open sourcing my health data and looking at that concept in general, I think a huge amount of progress could be made in that area and it is an active area that's, that's, that's occurring. Um, and even starting to look at magnetic neurosurgery and other things that maybe I can somehow develop uh, in lab or just explore. So there's some benefits, but the biggest benefit is a new perspective. And I just want you guys to all think about what that means if you are told that you have two weeks until they're cutting out a big chunk of your brain because it changes your perspective. And <clears throat> I wanted to share with you something. I sent an email out to all my friends and family <clears throat> when I heard this. 
and I tried to say, here's what I think is important. So this is copy and pasted from that email. Uh, you can't have a more honest statement. Uh, these are what I was thinking could be the last time I talked to these people. So <clears throat> first I said, perspective is everything, and uh, switching shoes, shoes yields the most powerful thoughts. Family and friends are what remain when the world blurs. Uh, secondly, it's a wild ride, and it's still a ride. To define the purpose of life is a null point, as that associates meaning to us, instead of pure reactions. That's the scientist in me. But it's elegant, mysterious, and pushes us to define us. Um, and I think that's the viewpoint that MIT and the benefit of MIT is. We can know it's a ride, but it's a scary ride unless you have information and make it a curious problem. And if it's a curious problem, it becomes an exciting ride. So a scary ride versus an exciting ride. And the last point is that I put in the email is, the world is a lovely, splendid, and fascinating place. But most of all, to me, it's a beautiful, uh, it's beautifully curious. And I wanted to end on that note to say this is why we do research. And I wanted to thank Matt and Agios and all of you. Um, it's been a very crazy couple months. Um, thank you to a whole number of people. And my surgical team and follow-up team uh, have been great. So I wanted to thank them. Thank you. And cancer is a sad thing to talk about. <laughs> so I wanted to end on a very happy note. So I asked all of my friends. I outsourced my dad. I said, anything you can send me, funny jokes, pictures. And my favorite TV show is Modern Family. And so I was just on my phone randomly. And a friend who had some crazy connections sent me this video which I'm going to end the presentation with. I don't know if you can hear the volume great, but maybe. Yes, Khan. Uh, happy brain surgery. So is the cast of Modern Family, one of my favorite TV shows. Happy brain surgery to you. Happy brain surgery to you. And it was just the, the best thing to receive when uh, you're unexpected. Don't forget to pull out the So, so with that, I uh, I thought that would be a fun way to end it. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody and uh, appreciate your time.